Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. On today's video, it's Wednesday, so it's another midweek mini mail call, number 41, which is amazing. I say that every single time, and I'm gonna keep saying that forever. <laughs> I just wanted to start off this video by saying you can now support the channel on Patreon. So if you're interested in doing that, you can check the link in the description below. And we're gonna get on to the mail call video. So without further ado, let's get right to it. package here. I don't know who it's from, actually. Don't see a from address on it. All right. Yes, we have a letter. It looks like it's written in a notepad or something. Got lots and lots of goodies in here. Wow, look at all this. Let me check out the letter here. It's from Andrew in Tucson, Arizona. He writes, I'd like to thank you so much for your excellent video series. Many times I have you on in the background as I work on projects of my own. I don't want to have to admit how many times I have moved the playhead uh, and dragged it back to the left to review what had just went over my head as I work on my own projects. I hope this older hardware PC software comes in handy. Given space constraints, I've restricted myself to minimal old hardware. And if you don't find any of this useful, please feel free to pass it on or throw it out. Well, don't worry. Anytime I have stuff that I get on mail call or anything else I have that I don't need, I have a community of friends here in Portland. And even though we're in the lockdown due to the human malware, I'll hit them up and ask them if they need any of this stuff and we'll do exchanges. They'll, they'll come by and I'll, you know, with our masks, we'll hand over the stuff. So nothing really goes to waste. I always get it out to someone else who could use it. So let's take a look here. So he has sent me a couple brand new packages of zip disks. I've got two 10 packs still in the blister packaging. I do use zip drives quite a bit, so it's definitely useful. We have something here for the PC. Let's slide this out. Whoa, what? <laughs> Ridiculous. Look at all the RAM. It is packed in there. Now these are SIPs, single inline pin package. I don't know what SIP stands for. I'm not totally sure what this is. I mean, this looks like a single board computer with all this RAM and this is a 386DX uh, 20 megahertz and a Cyrix FastMath math coprocessor. And then the whole thing has just a single 8-bit ISA bus connector. So if this is a single board computer, you have lots of RAM available to the processor, but all the other peripherals are gonna be hooked up through a slow 8-bit bus. Like, why isn't it 16-bit? Very interesting. It does have a date code of 1986 on it. So that'll be interesting to look at. All right, next up is, oh, <laughs> that's cool. It's a prototype board, an ISA prototype board. That's cool. JDR Micro Electronics does have some large 40 pin dips here. I'm not quite sure what that does. He writes ISA prototype card with docs. Oh, it does have some documentation here. Next up, we have a Zip 100. Okay, so here's some Radio Shack packaging. It's very old, and I think it had this chip in here, and it is the AY38910A sound chip. He says it was the sound chip that was used with the Coco line of computers. Is that for real? I don't really think that that's the case, but this was used in a lot of things. Maybe he's right that it was in the Coco, but this AY sound chip, pretty popular stuff. It was in lots of game consoles, stuff like that throughout history. The blister packaging has completely disintegrated. It's yellowed and look, it's just brittle as all get out. I'm gonna keep this Radio Shack card, but I'm gonna put this in the trash. Otherwise it'll disintegrate and send plastic shards all over the basement. All right, next up we have something in a box here and it looks to be an LS120 floppy drive. And it's something that seemingly goes into a laptop. And lastly, we have an ATI EGA Wonder. And that's really nice. It's an actual EGA card from ATI. These are, these are pretty nice. Awesome. So Andrew sent some really cool stuff. Thank you very much. Let's take a look at this on the bench. So some pretty neat stuff from Andrew. Let's start at the top of the pile here. Portable sound generator from Radio Shack. They didn't make it or anything, but they sold it. AY38910A which was the sound chip that was used in a ton of different game consoles on computers. The Intellivision and Vectrex game console, the Amstrad CPC, the Auric One, 
The very first MSX computer, the later ZX Spectrums when it added multi-channel sound, added one of these chips. And also on the Apple II, there was the Cricut and the Mockingboard cards that used these. I think the Mockingboard and the Apple II actually had two chips on there. The original packaging for this would have had the chip in here and probably a data sheet on the back. It's the way the Radio Shack packaging was. That packaging is not included, so that data sheet is not included, but luckily it is easily available online. And I don't currently have anything that would use this sound chip, so this will be going to my spare parts. I don't have a way to test it right now, but it is nice to have an authentic AY sound chip in stock. All right, so next up, this is the instructions for this card right here. It is quite a cool prototype card for PCs. ISA bus connector here, lots of bread bin connections here for putting your components on. There are bus transceiver chips here, so no matter what you do on here, you can't possibly do anything bad to your PC. Taking a closer look at what's on this board, it's really a cool design. So all of the ICs are in sockets, so in case you do damage one, they're easy to replace. All of these pin headers here are for connecting your jumper leads from this over to the breadboard. There's a dip switch block, which probably works in conjunction with this gal. And this would be programmed to allow you to control the base I.O. and whatnot. So how you would talk to this board from the PC side. These ICs down here are buffer chips. Now this one here is an LS245 and that's because this is an 8-bit slot. So you only need a 8 bits of bidirectional buffering. So that's what this is. And then the rest of these here are going to be buffering all the other signals that come through on the ISA bus. Like the address lines, interrupt lines, things like that. So that's pretty cool. All of this stuff means that even if you accidentally short something, whatever you're doing on here, because these chips are between everything on this board and your computer, you should never cause, or you should never be able to cause any harm to your PC. This I see here is an 8255, which is a parallel I.O. controller chip. So essentially you would talk to this thing through a base I.O. and then you can control these parallel output lines, which is probably all of these pins along the top row here. It has 24 I.O. lines, which are fully programmable for input or output. And you can put your components here, hook it up to these pin headers, and you could do all the I.O. you could possibly want with this chip. And then the final I.C. up here is an Intel 8253, which is a clock slash timer chip. So you talk to this as well, and you're able to probably create clock signals and do timer interrupts and who knows what with this thing. So pretty flexible card. There's a lot going on right here that would allow you pretty much everything you need to talk in and out of your computer. So if you imagine something like an Arduino, these days this is what you'd be using to you know, control servos and whatnot. You could pretty much do everything you need with this board controlled from the PC, for instance, like BASIC or Pascal or C or whatever. You could easily do everything you can do with this using a computer. And the days before these cheap microcontrollers on these with open source IDEs or integrated development environments, Pretty much stuff like this was what you needed to do that type of project. There's a date code of 1989 on the board there. Although some of these chips seem to have 1999 date codes, which seems a little too late. There'd be no way that this thing would be sold then. This has an 88 date code. It's hard to tell when this board is actually from. On the back, not a lot going on. That's just the glue from the breadboards being stuck on there. Andrew sent along the documentation. So JDR Micro Devices from San Jose, California, model number PDS-601. They did offer a 16-bit version, which was the PDS-611. And here it says, the card was designed with the engineer technician hobbyist in mind. All the incoming bus signals are buffered through buffer drivers and test points for hooking into those signals are clearly labeled. The buffer drivers mean that you're pretty much safe to not damage your computer. I mean, it's still possible, but it, much more difficult with those buffer chips, you're more likely to just damage the buffer chip. This page literally goes through all the ICs on there and explains exactly what they are. That's pretty nice. This is very comprehensive. Since both the parallel I.O. chip and the counter are Intel parts, it recommends referring to Intel's documentation for exact information and usage on those ICs. Here's a section that I mentioned on how the addresses are decoded using that gal chip that's on there. So it tells you how to set your dip switches. And they actually list out the source code for the gal chip or the pal chip. I think is it a, uh, it's actually a gal, so it's reprogrammable. They list out the exact source code. Nowadays, you could use a program like WinCouple, C-U-P-L. You could put this in there and you could actually alter the code, flash a new copy of the code onto here, say using a 
Mini Pro, that's the little USB EEPROM programmer, and uh, change the way the addresses are decoded. That's pretty cool. The source code's relatively simple, defines the pins, and then it uses these logic equations to control when things get selected. And then included with the instructions, there's a type in basic program, which looks like it actually tests out the IO logic that's on here. So you can make sure that the card is working correctly, which pretty much confirms that, yeah, you could just use simple basic programs to completely control everything that you add onto this card. This would have been amazing for the hobbyist. Wow, very cool. I knew that stuff like this probably existed back in the day, but I had never personally seen anything like this. And I'm assuming similar cards existed for the Apple II as well. I think at some point in the future it might be fun to try to build up a little project on here, maybe drive a little LCD screen using uh, the parallel I.O. chip here. That would be pretty fun to do from BASIC on a PC XT. Hmm. All right, next up we have a zip drive. It's an internal zip drive, so three and a half inch, and it's got an a Tappy IDE interface on it. So it's all pretty standard stuff. A little something just fell out of it. I know I've talked about zip drives a bunch on the channel and I actually have one of these drives exactly like this in my lab computer, which is above the camera here. I use it all the time. I have USB parallel port zip drives, uh, SCSI zip drives that are external. And, and sometimes it's really convenient to copy files from my lab machine onto a Mac or something else using the IDE drive that still works perfectly on Windows 10. Why don't I see if I can give this thing a quick test? Um, in fact, actually just right here are the zip disks that were sent by Andrew, two boxes. Let's cut these open and try one of these disks on this drive hooked up to my computer through this USB interface here. Before I toss this away, it says it's 10 zip 100 disks for PC or Mac. Durable, portable, and secure. I've mentioned this before that people complain about zip drives being particularly unreliable. I personally haven't really had any problems with them. I have several zip drives. They all work. It was back in the day. I used to carry my entire email collection. I had like a email spool file basically on a zip disk. And the reason why I did that is because I like to be able to read all of my email while, whether I was at home or at work. I think I used Eudora if I recall. And it was all stored on that zip disk. And I'd stick it in my zip drive at the office and I'd boot up Eudora, which would use the mail spool file on the zip disk. And it would go download new messages and stuff, pop three and save them to that file. And that way I had all my mail contained on this nice zip disk. And when I went back and forth home to work, I had everything fully available. And that was really before the days of web mail like we have nowadays, right? This was early on when basically you would download mail into your computer and it was there permanently. You couldn't access it when you weren't at home. So I really found that zip drive super convenient and I kept a backup copy of my entire spool file. So in case you know, it did get corrupted or damaged, I wouldn't lose everything. And I never did. The disk was super reliable and it would sit in my zip drive at work all day, every day I was in the office and I would use it all the time when I was at home as well because you had to have the disk in there to use the mail program. Not much to say other than there's a copyright 2003 date on here and it says assembled in Malaysia. Now I can say that when I was using this zip disk for storage, it was in the 90s, late 90s, I think, maybe around 97, 98. So I'm not sure, oh, interesting that there are A, multiple colors, and B, there's no boxes, because zip disks came with these nice clear boxes to cover the disk. And I guess by 2003, they were getting cheaper, so they didn't even bother with the boxes. I like the colors, kind of cool. They're typically this grayish color right here. This is what they look like normally. I've never, I don't think I have any of these disks that have the bright colors on them. That's neat. Up on the workbench here, I have like Mac OS 7 plus emulation, and this is the plastic case I was talking about. So. Here's a zip disk, like a typical one that I actually have stuff on here, like a Mac OS 7. This boots a Mac, so if I need to boot a Macintosh, I can just pop that in and boot it right up. So that's why these things are so useful. So let's give this zip drive a little power here and pop a disk in. So I've powered up. I don't have anything connected, obviously. Let's just pop in one of these disks here, make sure it actually spins and doesn't sound horrible. Sounds completely normal. We're gonna plug this USB IDE interface into it. Connect this to my USB cord, which is just right over here. 
I'll turn on the power of the drive. Okay, it's on. The computer just detected something, and here we go, it's refreshing. Disk drive, iOmega Zip 100 USB. The ATA one is the one that's actually in my computer now. So I'll just pop this disk in here and we should be able to format it. All right, it says USB G drive. I think we're gonna have to run disk manager. Yeah, unknown capacity. I think there is no partition on it. Here we are in disk manager, 96 megabytes unallocated. And like I said, no partition. Now, typically you would buy zip disk that said PC format or Mac format. They'd already be formatted. So as a, an end user, you didn't have to go through this formatting process that I am doing right here. Let's switch it over to fat. Don't need NTFS, quick format. Request failed due to fatal hardware error. Uh-oh. Why don't I try this disk inside my lab computer and we'll see if we can format it there. Okay, there it is. Hey, that's not a good sign. It was already formatted. We open it up here. Mac format options. PC users click here. What happens if we click here? <laughs> it's gonna install some kind of malware on my computer. Look at the date, 2002. Of course, Windows 10 is really backwards compatible. Connecting to the internet. Give me a break. Oh, that is hilarious. Well, definitely the disk is working. Let's just do a quick format on Windows 10 here. Quick format. But the fact actually didn't show up when this drive was reading it, I guess means that, okay, it formatted, no problem. Might mean that the drive is faulty. So let's give this a try again now that it's formatted freshly. Sounds normal. Like, you know, we're not hearing a click of death or any of the other typical failures you get on zip drives. Doesn't make weird noises, but we're not seeing anything. Yeah, it just says unallocated. I mean, it's definitely seeing it. So it's not like the USB interface isn't working. Not a good sign. I guess this thing is faulty. iOmega Zip 100 USB. I mean, I don't know how much to see here. Other than the fact it's not reading anything. If I right click and I say eject, it's definitely talking to the drive and there it is, it ejected it. So I guess this thing is not working. I have definitely used zip drives like this on this interface. It works fine. I've never had an issue talking through USB. So I'm assuming this drive is faulty, unfortunately. So this zip drive may be bad. I'll need to do further testing outside of this USB adapter here, just hooked up to a computer directly just to make sure, but I'm pretty sure this is bad. And if that's the case, I have some other removable drives here. This is a PsyQuest three and a half inch drive. And this is an iOmega Bernoulli drive, 90 megabytes. This drive is bad, this drive is bad. So I thought that would make interesting teardowns, not to mention this drive may be bad as well. So look for a future video where I tear down some interesting removable media drives. And all these zip disks are surely working, which is very cool. I have a little stash of zip disks. So if anyone's thinking of sending me more, I am all set. I have lots of these now, especially with 20 more, more than I'd ever need. But I am glad to have some new disks because maybe eventually they will start failing and it will be good to have some spares. All right, on to the beast here, the beast. Look at this card. I just, it's a beast, it is crazy. So all this RAM here, these are what are called SIPs. Single inline package or something, I don't know. I'm gonna take one out. Basically, they're just regular SIMs, 30 pin SIMs, but they have pins soldered onto them so that they can be inserted into standard pin headers. So if, now that there's two removed, notice there it's just standard pin headers, 2.54 millimeter ones, Nothing special, you don't need bespoke pin sockets. If we take a look at one of these memory modules here, you'll notice it's just a standard one megabyte 30 pin SIM and they've soldered these on. Toyocom, made in Japan. So back around 1990, 1991, when I started working in a computer store, I remember working on computers, 3D6 motherboards that had these types of memory modules on them as opposed to having SIM sockets. And it should be kind of obvious that one of the benefits of these SIPs, S-I-P-P, -P, is that you get much higher density. So you could really squish these in a lot closer than you could with SIM sockets. 
So with 24 sockets being on here, and these being one meg modules, one of them is missing, unfortunately. 24 megs of RAM is quite a lot for something that has a 3D6 on it. And I'm looking at the date codes, and I see a real hodgepodge of date codes, but it looks like 1987-ish is when this came out. So imagine in 1987 having something that had 24 megabytes of RAM. How much could this have cost? It would have been so, so outrageously expensive. So if I even want to attempt to try to get this thing working, I'm going to need to find a source for these little pins. Because I could take a standard 30-pin memory SIM, which I have quite a few of, make sure it works, test it in something else, and then solder those pins on there, and then I would be able to connect it up to the motherboard. But the pins are kind of interesting. They're like surface mount or something. Like they don't go through any holes. So, so it's obviously a very specific kind of pin that was used to make these. Anyhow, looking at the rest of this thing, it is really, really densely packed. So we have a 20 megahertz 386 processor. We have a Cyrix FastMath MathCo processor, which is like a 387 compatible chip. And then here is static RAM that may be used as cache to speed this up, but it might also be the interface memory between the main host computer and this coprocessor card. The dip switches in the corner probably select the base I.O. that this card talks to the main host on. And it's right here on the corner, made in USA, the humming board. And on the bottom, copyright, AI Architects, Incorporated, 1986. On the back of the board, you can actually see that this is a blue PCB, which is pretty cool. And judging by the fact that there are hardly any traces back here, this is definitely a multi-layer board, four, maybe six layers, which means if there were any damage to this thing, troubleshooting and fixing those bad traces would be next to impossible. So looking around for information on this card, it's really not much to find. I found this one artifact detail page for the Computer History Museum. It says Hummingboard PC daughter board with 3D6 in memory. It's pretty much what we know. And they just wrote in what's written on the card on the bottom, so not much to see there. But I also found this, which is in Computer World magazine. Let's see if I can find a date here. August 11th, 1986. There's an article here that says Gold Hill to Broaden Line. I guess that's the manufacturer maybe of this card, actually. It says here that Gold Hill will announce a product developed jointly with AI Architects of Cambridge, Mass. So that's this card we have right in front of us, dubbed the 3D6 Humming Board. The product is intended to help software developers, corporations, value-added resellers, and OEMs develop and deliver large AI application. The board comes bundled with Golden Hill's GC Lisp 3D6 development and as much as 24 megabytes of onboard memory, which is exactly what we have going on with this card. According to officials at the two companies, the 3D6 humming board cost-effectively converts a personal computer into a high-end Lisp machine built around the 16 MHz Intel 8386 that enables PCXT or ATs to run GC Lisp approximately five times faster and greatly speeds the critical edit compile debug loop. So it says 16 megahertz, and this is a 20 megahertz part. So clearly, as time went on, they maybe increased the speed. Although the crystal oscillator on the corner here, unfortunately, it's been soldered onto, so I can't tell what the speed is on there, but this might actually be running it at 16 megahertz. The article goes on to say the 3D6 humming board offers an unprecedented level of Lisp machine price performance. Running GC Lisp, the 3D6 humming board is the first affordable Lisp delivery engine powerful enough to run the most demanding applications. And the humming board is also an excellent productivity tool for program development. It goes on to say the humming board can use either 256K or 1 meg dynamic random access memory chips to bring the memory from 6 megabytes or to 24 megabytes respectively. So I, I read that and I think that means that you need to have this fully populated with memory. So you can either have 256 SIMs in here, or SIPs that is, giving you that 6 megabytes or you can pump it up all the way to the 24 megs, which I think is what's on here. Although, let me pop out one of these memory modules here. These look like they're different than the other, so these could easily be 256K ones. I really do remember getting these out was a bit of a fiddle back in the day, and it was very easy to bend those pins. And yes, this is actually 256K right here. So that implies that this actually has eight megs of one meg SIMs, and then it has one, two, three, four of 256. 
So a total of 12. It goes on to say the board's 32-bit memory path, right? That's for this here. And the 2K byte high-speed cache memory yield a processor memory cycle time typically seen in super mini computers, according to Wang. So this is the Cypress cache memory for the processor. Neat, 2K. It goes on to say, when the board is used, the host PC processor becomes the IO processor. Included in the package is an interface for sharing memory with the host processor, according to the Lotus Intel Oh, whoa, EMS. So this, all of this RAM becomes EMS memory for your computer. So you could put this into a, an XT, for instance, because it's an 8-bit slot, and have 24 megs of RAM available. So I guess the intent is you use EMS to load the memory with the program, whatever you're doing, and then you kick off the instruction using the 386. I mean, this is a quite a wild card. And unfortunately, that's the end of this article. So there's no additional information on how much this card costs. Yeah, down here on the next page is some other article. I have jumped to the start of the article in case it has a price here, but yeah, it talks about 3D6 based add-on development system for the XT and the AT. And unfortunately, it doesn't talk about the price at all. So that is absolutely fascinating. Now, of course, without software, this thing is gonna be completely useless. So if you are aware of any place to get information on the software, the documentation for this, I'd love to know. In fact, if you could just figure out how much this thing costs, I'd be super curious to know as well. But obviously we're not gonna get anywhere unless I can adapt one of these SIMs to work in these sockets as well. And otherwise we're not gonna be able to even try to boot this thing up. What a wild and interesting card. This thing would have cost an absolute fortune back when it came out. The next thing Andrew sent is this, an LS120 floppy disk drive option module. So LS120 is sort of like a zip drive, but in a regular floppy drive format, that's backwards compatible with reading standard three and a half inch disks. In fact, this one here says it can read double density and high density and high density 1.2 megs. Okay, whatever, must be a three and a half inch format like that. But it also reads 120 megabyte disks. And it uses the standard ATAPI interface, so regular IDE. And then looking here, I guess there is different speeds, 8x, 2x, 3x, 5x. I heard from someone that these run at 5x, but maybe they eventually made an 8x module. I think that means this reads floppy disks at 8x speed. The rest of the box is pretty nondescript, nothing really on here. And unfortunately, when we open this up, here's the drive. The real unfortunate thing is, look at that. It uses a laptop style interface. Well, there it is, that's the logo for the LS120. And this is very low profile laptop size. So if you're aware of a way to interface this to standard IDE, I remember back in the day seeing a little adapter. Like I think I had a CD-ROM drive from a laptop that had this and there was a little circuit board you could plug in and then it had a standard laptop IDE connector. But I haven't seen one of those in forever. But incidentally, I actually have another LS120 drive right here this was not sent in by Andrew, it was given to me locally in town, but it's the model LKM F433-1. It's made by Matsushita. This definitely has an IDE interface on the back, small Berg style power connector, and everything is pretty standard there. And if we look at the front, there's that same icon for the LS120. I don't have the faceplate for this, but this would obviously be for installing in a computer, just like that zip drive we looked at a second ago and it has an eject button that is clicky, meaning that this has a motorized eject mechanism. Now I have tested this and I, with a regular floppy drive. I powered it up, it takes it in, it spins up. It sounds like a zip disk to be honest, but it's reading even a normal 1.44. But unfortunately I can't seem to get this to work at all either. But it may just be that I'm trying it on Windows 10. I was using that same USB adapter. It wouldn't even show the drive. I mean, it, it showed a USB device, but it, it had errors, it would have an exclamation point. So it may not be compatible. I need to test this on a machine that fully supports it. So I will do that before I rule this as bad. But yeah, it's funny that I just got this when this came with mail call as well. But unfortunately, I can't use this one. If you have experience using these LS120 drives, I'd love to hear about it because they seem pretty cool. And to be able to read floppy disks over an IDE interface, that's quite cool. All right, and the last thing that Andrew sent is this, which is an ATI EGA, what, all-in-wonder? Is that what it's called? No, it's called the EGA Wonder. 
IBM came out with their EGA standard. It was quite a large card. It was very expensive. And companies started to consolidate all of those EGA chips into these smaller ICs and then add extra features. And a card like this is one such card. It has additional capabilities over the IBM EGA card. So let's take a look at what those are. Right away, it says any software, any monitor, any time. And this is by ATI, yes, what is now AMD. But ATI, as you see in the back of the book here, was a Canadian company and they were just really well known for making some really, really good video cards, even as far back as stuff like EGA cards. So this book is edition 1.1, January 1987. The EGA Wonder you have just purchased represents a compatibility breakthrough. In the past, most video boards were limited in that they were designed to run one software standard on one or possibly two types of monitors. And this is what I was referring to, the EGA card from IBM. It could work with the CGA monitor, the 5153, but you wouldn't even get all the video modes. But cards like this allowed you to go way beyond what that original EGA card could do. Advanced adapters such as the ATI Graphics Solution can run several software standards on several types of monitors. Now, in the new ATI EGA Wonder brings the design philosophy of the graphics solution to the EGA standard. The compatibility breakthrough is that runs all four of the major software standards, EGA, CGA, MDA, and Hercules on any of the four monitor types. An, an enhanced graphics display, which is EGA monitor, an RGB color graphics display, that's a CGA monitor, a TTL monochrome display, and a composite display. It can run 132 columns on any of these monitor types. What's best is it makes possible to run EGA software without upgrading to an EGA monitor. Only the EGA Wonder displays EGA, CGA, MDA, and Hercules on the internal monitor of the PC Portable as well, and the internal monitor of the Compact PC Portable. Now, before you get too excited, I do have a Compact Portable. Unfortunately, I read through the manual already, and you need a special adapter board that plugs into this feature connector here to drive the internal monitor in the Compact. So there's no way I can do that. But for the IBM though, I think it connects to this, this pin header right here and it can drive the internal monitor on the IBM portable. It talks about how it maximizes monitor display quality. Like running CGA software on an EGA monitor, you get the high resolution font and the graphics are double scanned for higher quality image. Well, that's interesting. When running EGA or CGA on a TTL monochrome monitor, a high resolution eight x 14 text is displays and colors are converted into shades Graphics are full screen and no pre-boot drivers are required. Yeah, for Hercules cards, you could emulate CGA with software, but it was slow and it was chunky and it was ugly. This thing does it in hardware. When running EGA software on an RGB monitor, a palette of 64 colors is available and interlacing produces the high resolution text and the high resolution graphics. Yes, normally, a CGA monitor only has 200 lines of resolution and EGA is, I think, 350. But with a card like this, it obviously switches into interlaced mode to give you those extra lines. And somehow it figures out, maybe through some kind of dithering, how to do the 64 colors. That is cool. So indeed, this is a pretty cool card and talks all about the different resolutions and modes it supports. Here it is. So 640 by 350, 16 colors from a palette of 64 colors. So that is a standard EGA resolution that you could do on the IBM card if you had the RAM expansion. And this could only work if you had an actual IBM EGA monitor, it would not work with the CGA monitor. And that's because the digital connector actually has three extra lines on it that aren't on the CGA monitor. So there's really no way to create those colors on a CGA monitor. Somehow this thing is doing it. So it's either flickering the colors or dithering or it's doing something trickery, some kind of trickery is happening. Wouldn't normally be possible. And indeed, here's just a little bit more, like you could have a TTL monochrome display and you can get all of the colors of EGA and CGA and they're converted into shades. No drivers are required, full screen graphics. And unlike any EGA card I'm aware of, or at least the IBM one, you could also run all of these modes, including 132 column on a composite monitor. Like we're gonna have to test that. So the manual is relatively comprehensive. It just goes into all the connections and things like that. It says light pen port. Here is the connector for the PC portable, the feature connector, 256K of RAM. That's what's on here. So that's the full amount for the EGA cards. The top of these two RCA connectors, this one right here, 
That is composite monitor connector. Now on a regular IBM EGA card, these are there, but they don't do anything. They're like part of some optional feature thing. Like you might be, there was a thing to plug into it that would give you composite output. Definitely was not there by default. And this goes into all the switches and stuff like that. I think the manual is available online already. So this is not anything completely revolutionary. If uh, there's a reason that this is not available online and you're watching this, let me know and I'll, I'll try to scan this. So let's do a little testing. I want to test out this composite port. Check out those shades of gray that it's going to produce. This will not produce color on a composite monitor. It's really for being used with a monochrome monitor so you get nice sharp text. So I have right here my test bench set up. So it's my Pentium here that's, uh, uh, you know, I think you've, everyone has seen this thing before. I've tested lots of RAM on this thing before. It sits on a power supply. It's all kind of janky. See, it's not actually attached. It just sits on there. So I really could use a nice test bed, something like Shelby did on Tech Tangents just recently, but this works fine for me right now. So this is just an ISA card, so we'll just pop it in there. I'm just gonna grab this monochrome monitor here. It's one that you've seen in one of my CRT videos. I think I swapped, it was amber, now this is green. I went ahead and set up the dip switches on the card. They're on the back here for composite. There's a specific set of configurations for composite output. The manual references some programs to configure the EGA card. So luckily, because an ATI card is so popular, I was able to find those. So I downloaded those and I copied them onto the compact flash card on this machine. I just hooked up this composite video cable. Let's turn on the monitor and everything should be plugged in. I have a keyboard down here and let's power on the computer. Oh, I just saw a little flicker on there. Something's happening. Oh, there it is. Look at that. I've gone ahead and I've locked the focus, so hopefully that avoids all focus hunting. And I gotta say, it looks good. It really looks good. That is nice. So I have a directory called EGA here, and it's this SMS program right here. And this is what allows us to configure this card in all the various modes. So to go down through these modes, the first one here is just MDA emulation running in composite mode. So it just means it's black and white as opposed to we won't get these shades anymore. Otherwise the text will look the same. Then we have the regular CGA color text. So 16 shades of gray, or because it would be 16 colors. We have color text EGA enhanced. So this is the higher resolution text. Let's try that. That supposedly runs in interlaced mode. So I'm gonna hit C, enter, Oh, it is. It's running in interlaced mode. It's definitely a little flickery. It is definitely a little flickery. If you're used to looking at text on the Amiga, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. If we go back to SMS. It's funny how the shading is much darker there, but there's definitely a flicker, but the text does look really sharp. So it's not that bad, but it's, it is flickery. Then we have 132 by 25 columns, let's pick that. All right, so it's like condensed text. Unfortunately, it's like off the side of the screen. So if we run SMS here, I think I saw, here we go at the bottom, 132 column screen adjustment. So let's try that. Okay, so you can move left and right. Oh, it does not like it. <laughs> when it moves too far that way, it, it glitches out. So this monitor has a width adjustment on the back, which I am turning in. So I think that should do the trick. Let's see, go back to EGA, SMS, and we'll go to the adjustment settings. Oh yeah, okay, that worked. So the position adjustment on this monitor is internal. I can't adjust that, but at least now the edges of the text are on screen. So when we exit out of here, it's not gonna be off the screen. Now the problem is DOS doesn't really support 132 columns. So clearly I can type the whole width, but if I do dir slash w, the width of the display is still 80 columns. Maybe there's a command to change that, I, I don't know. But ultimately programs like Lotus 123 spreadsheets and stuff did support this mode so you could get more text on the screen. I mean, it's pretty squished looking, but it does work. Now there's 132 by 44 columns, but when I pick that it's flashing down here and it says not supported by this monitor. So that must only work when you have a true EGA compatible monitor. Hercules graphics, 640 by 400. Let's pick that one. Default Hercules mode is 640 by 400. Okay, I guess there are two different resolutions for Hercules graphics, and clearly this is a text mode. We're not in a graphics mode here, so it must depend on which one you're running. The other, oops. Oh, it switched into a monochrome text mode here. That's why the color is all, all screwy. Hercules graphics, 720 by 348. 
And there, Hercules mode is now 720 by 348. So it is interesting that if I pick the 400 line one and we exit out, oh yeah, okay, it looks the same. So if we go to games, PX3, that's Planet X3. This is David Murray's Planet X3. He has a Hercules mode of 640 by 300. Let's just try that, PC speaker. Oh, that's flickery. Sorry about that. I have a feeling that didn't work because in here, he's using the 720 mode and I, I defaulted to the 640 by 400. Let me switch it to this one and we'll try Planet X3 again and we'll do Hercules. Nope, still not working. Anyhow, if we go back, there's some other options in here. Enable VGA BIOS entry points. So I wonder if this has some kind of VGA rudimentary emulation. It clearly doesn't support like 250 colors, stuff like that. Maybe it does. So you can enable, disable it. You can also disable the EGA BIOS entry points. It hides the fact this is an EGA card from EGA software. And then you can enable and disable the enhanced features. I thought there was a section in the manual here about these enhanced features, but I can't really find it right there. So anyhow. So yeah, let's go to color mode, EGA enhanced, and we'll run Planet X3 EGA. And that should give us, look at that. Look at all those nice shades. Doesn't that look good? Now this game is not using the 350 line mode, it's using 200 line, so it's not interlaced right now. That's why we have full screen graphics, but it is using 640 by 200, and on an actual EGA monitor, it uses beautiful dithering to show you all of the 256 colors that's on the VGA graphics asset that he's using. Clearly on this monitor, it's a little less fancy looking, but for composite, it looks great. I have started up Check It, so definitely on these horizontal lines here, definitely has flicker because of the interlaced text here. So if I was using a composite monitor like this, I would rather not run text mode in this interlaced mode. I would rather use the CGA font. It just looks a lot clearer and better than this. But we can look at these graphics test modes. This kind of loops through everything this card can do. So this will be CGA stuff here. And this has is a bit darker because it's got shading. This, it would be in color otherwise. This is 640 by 200 native CGA resolution. Same thing here, but EGA colors. And this flickery thing now is 640 by 350, which is EGA resolution. And it's interesting how it's all shifted towards the top. So it said it had a full screen graphics capability. Maybe it's possible with special drivers to use all 400 lines that are available in this frame buffer, but normal EGA programs aren't gonna know about that. They're only gonna give you 350 lines. And it's very flickery. I don't know how it comes across in the camera, but to my eyes, that's flickering a lot but it's so cool that it can do it. And then this is the 16 color EGA mode, so normal TTL colors you would see on a CGA monitor, and it looks really nice. The shading is just perfect. And now we should have interlacing. There it is, 16 colors with the interlacing. Theoretically, this is the mode that could do 64 shades as well, well, from a palette of 64 shades, but I don't have any software that can use the 64 color modes. So thank you very much, Andrew, for sending in these interesting cards and parts. I'm absolutely fascinated by this humming board. And I gotta say this EGA card, it's so cool. I have never had an EGA card like this where I knew the brand and I had the manual for it. I have several other cards that look similar to this, but they are generic clones of say the ATI card or whatever. And I don't have the manual. I don't know the jumper settings. And every time I need to figure something out, I just have to try all the jumpers. Uh, without looking at a manual try to figure out what to do. I was never aware of any EGA card that had composite. So yeah, very cool stuff. So thanks again for sending this in, super fascinating. And then with that, that is gonna be the end of this mail call video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, I appreciate a thumbs up. But if you didn't, you know all that stuff to do and you can now support the channel on Patreon. There's a link in the description below. And that's gonna be it. Stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.